Let's take a look at the vestibular organs. The vestibular organs are going to give us our sense of movement in space based off of the change in gravitational acceleration or g-force. And so when we look at the vestibular organs, we're looking at structures that come away from the cochlea stemming off of the vestibular area of the inner ear in which we have the saccular utricle, which will give us our static position in space, and our semicircular canals, which will give us our motion in space. Notice that the semicircular canals are going to be oriented based off of the three primary axes of geometry that we have for our body, whereas the saccular utricle are oriented in an X and a Y plane relative to a vertical axis, an erect posture. In this, we have a labyrinthal system. This labyrinthal system is made up of the membranous labyrinth and the bony labyrinth, containing of paralymph and endolymph, very similar to the cochlea. There are outcrops at the junction point between the semicircular canals and the vestibule known as the ampulla. The ampulla is the area where we happen to have the receptors for the semicircular canals. If we look at the saccular utricle, it is set up in what's referred to as an otolithical membranous structure. And so this otolithical membranous structure has the same type of structure that we saw within the organ accordion where we have this stereoscopic cilia coming away from hair cells, supported by the support cells. The support cells have what's referred to as myoepithelium within it. This myoepithelium is going to tense the hair cells to the orientation of static posture for the person, even if it doesn't have to be vertical. The hair cell projections head into the otolithic membrane, which is a gelatinous uh, collagen matrix that is supporting a uh, biological crystal known as the otolus. The otolus float on the otolithic membrane and based off of changes of gravitational attraction around the otolithic membrane, it will cause a shift to the membrane itself, which will cause displacement of the hair cells based off of the position of the individual. The ampullate is slightly different. The ampulla is set up in such a way that it has high, long projections coming away from the basal membrane, known as the cupola. The cupola encapsulates the hair cells, and the hair cells are set up in such a way that they have a stereoscopic organization towards the apex of the ampulla. Just like with the otolithic membrane, we have support cells, which have some myopathial components within it, which based off of static positioning will tense the hair cells. And by tensing the hair cells, it will set them at such an angle so that it's going to detect the motion. But once motion is stable, it stops detecting the motion. And so the whole idea of the sac and the and the ampulla within the semicircular canals is to detect motion. And it does that by shifting of the receptors. And it, by shifting of the receptors, what it's able to do is it's able to determine what direction motion is taking place based off of changes of static position or the rate of static positional change. And so what the sacroiliacal is doing is it's giving me what is my sense of vertical position for the body. It's not giving me my sense of rotational motion. It's simply telling me where is vertical for my body. So if I'm standing up, that's vertical. If I'm leaning forward, once I stop leaning, that new lean becomes the new vertical axis. And what's up happening is that based off of displacement of the otolus, we get the displacement of the otolithic membrane, which causes the shift of the stereocilla towards the apical side of the hair cells. And if I shift towards the apical side of the hair cell, I get depolarization.
if I shift towards the basilar side or the short side of the hair cell, I get hyperpolarization. And the combination of depolarization and hyperpolarization based off of the path of convergence gives me my sense of position and my sense of change of position. The ampulla is a little bit different. The ampulla is going to be registering the motion of the endolymph within the labyrinth, within the membranous labyrinth. And the endolymph is going to move slightly after motion of the body. And so we get this small little bit of displacement followed by no displacement. And a small little bit of displacement is the indication of how quickly motion is taking place. In which if I displace towards the apex, I get depolarization. If I displace towards the basal area of the hair cell, I get hyperpolarization. And that's how I get my sense of motion. The three semicircular canals are set up in such a way that they are at perpendicular angles to each other based off of the three geometric axes of the body, the X, Y, and Z. And what it's doing is it's giving me my sense of motion in each one of those planes in what's referred to as a yaw, pitch, and roll sensation. Yaw is my spinning around my y-axis, doing like a pirouette. Pitch is spinning around my x-axis, like doing somersaults. Roll is like spinning around my z-axis, like doing sideways cartwheels. Each one of the semicircular canals will pick up a distinct sense of motion, where the anterior is going to pick up the sense of pitch, the forward and back angular rotation. The posterior is going to get my sense of roll, the side to side angular rotation. The lateral is going to get my sense of yaw, my rotation right to left. Whereas the sacral and the neutricle are going to give me my sense of linear motion, what is my horizontal and vertical position in space. Within the ear, the semicircular canals are set up in such a way so as to receive and perceive sensations based off of combining signals from the two sides of the body. Where within the 360 degree pattern of motion, we get overlapping signals from each of the semicircular canals based off of being stimulated or inhibited within the motions taking place. Based off of stimulation coming from one side, we'll look at one side, even though we don't get stimulation from one side, we get stimulation from both sides. And so let's say we get a sense of gravitational rotation. That sense of gravitational rotation is going to stimulate distinct cranial nerves on both the ipsilateral and contralateral side of the body to allow for eye tracking. And this eye tracking is going to allow us to keep the pupils of the eyes centered to the center of the visual field, regardless of the direction of motion that's taking place. And this, was, this causes what's referred to as a retrograde eye beat. That means that we're going to be away from the rotation. Along with eye beat, we get stimulation of the vestibular spinal tract, which is going to tighten muscles, cause muscular contraction, 
in particular muscle contraction within the trunk. So it's going to cause a secondary activation off of the anterior cortical spinal tract to keep my body posture in an erect position. And then we'll send secondary signals along the lateral cortical spinal tract or stimulation off the lateral cortical spinal tract coming from the vestibular spinal tract to do fine little maneuvering at the distal ends of the extremities so as to keep me rotating in a vertical position because of the angle of rotation. Lastly, we get we will get a signal that's going to head into the cortical areas, into the prior lobe, and then into the limbic system and frontal lobe to give me my sense of spin. Because we get a direct link into the limbic system and into the frontal lobe, and particularly into the prefrontal cortex within this pathway. Spinning and sense of spin can very quickly become pleasurable or non-pleasurable based off of our perception of the sense of spin, which is why some people really, really like going on roller coaster rides and getting spun around. And some people hate it and hate it and hate it. 